All right, guys, come on, make your way in. Um, it's good to see you guys. I hope you had a chance to get out and enjoy the nice weather the last few days. Um, we've spent a few weeks talking about love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind. The last couple of weeks we spent talking about how do we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. So now we're going to take a couple of weeks to talk about how do we love others. I want to start by talking about three stories from my own life. Um, first story, the job I was working at right before I started here uh, a few years ago, uh, I was cutting some base trim to put on the wall, and I was, got my piece, measured it, went up to the miter saw, was holding it up against the miter fence, started going, and then my hand spasmed and slid over and chopped off a little bit of my uh, thumb. And I'm like, ah, yeah, screaming, obviously, obviously. And I go over to the sink, and I'm trying to like wash it off, and you know, like, what is that? Is that a bone? I can't tell, but man, it hurts. While I'm going there, and while I'm there trying to attend to it, this guy starts lecturing me. You know why that happened, right? It's because you didn't do this, this, and this. Completely serious. I'm screaming in pain. What are you doing? Next. Uh, a couple years ago, I was out here in the lobby and I was uh, changing one of the light bulbs in the flush mount up on the ladder. Uh, the glass was kind of stuck, so I was kind of pulling it without trying to break the glass. This guy walks in, never seen him before, and he, in all seriousness, he says, do you have any idea what you're doing? Okay. Um, now, those are other people. Let's turn it here. You guys notice we made a lot of changes in the auditorium, right? Okay, looks great. A lot of great volunteers. It was a good time getting together, seeing some of you uh, helping out. And I was curious, you know, of what, what the guys would think after Christmas break. And some people came in and had some good things to say. Other people, the only thing out of their mouth was, you missed a spot. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tonight, we're going to talk about how men relate to other men. We, as believing men, right, we have a mix of people we interact with out in the world. We talked about how to relate to fellow believers. Now, how do we relate to, you never know what you're going to get at the grocery store, workplace, neighborhood. You're going to get a mix of guys. How do we interact with them? And then, towards the end, we'll talk about how can we love other men better? Other men better. So I imagine you guys have noticed over the years, some of you have more years than others, but you probably have noticed over the years that amongst men in conversation and whatnot, there's perversion, rudeness, lack of filter. Sometimes we put our foot in our mouth. Sometimes we uh, don't know how to relate to every single guy, so we just kind of pass them off or we only hang out with certain guys. I've done all of these things. I'm not trying to say I'm better but I have spent the last 20 years paying attention to this. The first time it dawned on me, when I was in high school in the football locker room, it was the habit of upperclassmen to give lowly, annoying tasks to the freshmen, right? Now you take that water bottle out, you move the wrestling mats, you do all this junk that we don't wanna do. And then when you would practice with them, they would go out of their way to physically abuse. Then I thought, okay, I'm now a junior and senior. I hated those men when they were doing that. Now I'm a junior and senior. Shouldn't I be leading by example? I didn't like it when they did this to me as a freshman. I'm not going to do that to the freshman. What's the point? We're on a team together. Does this actually help build camaraderie amongst a team? And I said, you know what? This, this way that we do, Why? Why do we do this? Why do we spend our time like this? Maybe this is an example that you've heard of. Okay, that was for me. But sometimes in common trends, just like we've looked at in the past few weeks, we'll do it again. Some common trends, and then we'll look at what the scriptures have to say. If you get a bunch of guys together, sometimes uh, what do we see? In movies, we'll usually see men are idiots, men are aloof, 
Men are incidental or the casual observers. Sometimes they're not the main character. Sometimes fathers are the bad guys. They're suppressing their kids. And we got to let kids live out their dreams and aspirations. Well, why are we letting our kids watch those movies? Right? Men overcompensate. You got to you got to get the girl, you got to blow up a bunch of stuff, and you got to show how jacked you are. Or maybe this picture is what you're thinking of for a man. Dote. Or uh, if you're a little older, maybe you'll get this one. Yes, Al Bundy. Right? The stereotypes abound. The strong, silent type, the self-reliant, Boys will be boys. Other common trends. You get a bunch of guys together, and maybe you're working on a project. Been there many, many times. Usually, what do we do? We cut into each other with so-called jokes, sarcasm that goes too far, where it's not clear you're joking. You use your wit as a knife. We have an abundance of jabs at what the other person fails at, continues to mess up, doesn't know how to do, so we gotta bring it up, and we gotta be quick, too. And I gotta get the first one, and I gotta get the last one, because then I'll win. What kind of sick game is that? Been there too many times, like, what, what are we doing? Do I wanna keep working with this person? Sometimes I had to, right? It's not like I get to change my coworkers all the time. What is the result of this game? You're always going to be oriented towards defending. Always being oriented towards watching out for threats and being aware of always what needs to be done on the offense. What is that gonna do to you over time? It's gonna wear you out. And it's gonna really restrict your ability to make good, deep friendships with other people. And it'll probably breed insecurity, overcompensating, hardening, some people will say, oh, that's just men being men. Or, well, that's how men bond. Some men try to bond like that, right? Question, if this is your common manner of exchange with a guy at work, you just kind of cut each other, cut each other, you gotta be quick, quick to the jabs, all that kind of stuff. When you don't work with that person anymore and you move to another company, do you take time and effort to still maintain that friendship? I'd be willing to say less likely than if you had good enjoyment with a friend or with someone at work. If you moved, you probably still want to make the effort to continue that friendship. If you had positive, helpful, healthy interactions. Those are a couple of objections, maybe a few more before we talk about the scriptures. Imagine some of this might be stirring in your head, because I've heard these. Are you trying to turn us into a bunch of women? Heard that one. All right. Well, I'm pretty sure changing the way you relate to others is going to have some good fallout for your wives, for your daughters, for your sisters. All right. This thought betrays a whole lot of problems. We can't go into all of them, but one of them is, well, women are made in the image of God. They tend to have some attributes more often than men. Those are good. Saying that, because you're essentially saying, well, turn us into women, as if that's a problem to have some of those attributes that they have that God also has. Tenderness, kindness, compassion. So, and sometimes when I try to confront other people about the way they talk and speak and interact with all the jabbing and all the, stuff, they'll usually turn around and say, well, hey, don't let pride get in the way. What? Like, do you have, if I came to you like that, could my pride be motivating me that I don't want to feel bad? Sure, it could be. You, you don't have to justify, do you show some evidence of the accusation of pride? Or did you come up with a quick label so as to excuse yourself? Last one, don't be so soft. Now, I can understand this, right? I don't want a bunch of men who are snowflakes who melt under any pressure at the first instance. I mean, 
that's not good. Like you just, oh, you just crack at any, anything that comes your way, any stress. No, we, like you're not trying to be a snowflake. But the opposite of that would be hardening. Is it your job to harden another person? Okay, because that, that can be what you're doing. Oh, I was only joking, you know, just don't be so soft, don't be so weak. Well, wait, is there a problem with actually having feelings? Actually thinking, you know, I shouldn't be treated this way. Why? why, why? Should I go back to unhealthy relationships over and over again? Sometimes I have to because they're at work the next day, right? Some roots. Pride. Competition. I have to have something to brag about. Right? I've got to have something to offer to be in this circle of people. I've got to have this certain achievement to continue to be in this group that I want to be a part of because I think that that's what being a man is. So let's open up to the scriptures and see just a handful of passages. And then in your discussion time, we'll talk a little bit about a few others. Romans 14. Romans 14. We'll do a couple of New Testament and a couple of Old Testament passages. Romans 14, 19. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for building up one another. Turn a few pages over to the right. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 29. You must not let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for building up of the one in need, that it would give grace to those who hear the words you speak. Okay? Now, can that apply to coarse jokes? Sure. There's lots of application here. Let's do two passages over in the book of Proverbs. Over in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12, verses 17 to 19. The faithful witness tells what is right, but a false witness speaks deceit. Speaking recklessly is like the thrust of a sword, but the words of the wise bring healing. The one who tells the truth will endure forever, but the one who lies will last only for a moment. One more here, same page right there, Proverbs 13, verse 20. The one who associates with the wise grows wise. You can be that person that causes other people to grow wise. But a companion of fools suffers harm. I think a lot of the ways men relate to other men is what it is. But should it be that way? Can it be something different? Can it be something Better, can it be something that reflects God's character in you as a light to then show it to other men? Say, there's a better way of doing life. There's a better way of going about it. Because what wounds can you inflict on other people? Right? Your stereotypes, your preferences often become what causes you to filter and say, oh, if someone doesn't fulfill this preference, then they can't be in the group with me. Right? If they can't bench 300 pounds, okay, or if they don't know how to uh, put two by fours up in a wall, or if they don't know every theorem in math class, or what, all kinds of, like, really? Those are your filters for letting men into being with you, having relationships, having friends? No, those are preferences. They don't really have much to do with the scriptures. What wounds are you inflicting on yourself? I've had to deal with this myself. If I, I learned over 
junior high and high school and then a little bit, I, I shut down emotions because in the group of people I was with, emotions would not fly. You harden yourself, you don't show anything and you learn how to shut other people down. What am I doing to myself? Had I not stopped that, when I got to marriage a few years later, my wife would be like, you're like a closed book. I can never understand you, I, right? I like you, I care about you, but how, like, where is this going? How do we deal with this? I'm thankful that someone spoke into my life and say, this is an issue, you gotta take care of this. Shutting that thing down was a problem. So how do we turn what is into what could and should be? I give you guys five suggestions and then you can have more time to discuss how you go about them in your own life, in your small groups. First, you got some great examples in scripture. Uh, who's the best example? Jesus, yes, the common answer works here. How does Jesus interact, right? You can see these few passages up here. Jesus interacts with Pharisees quite often. They're men. He act, interacts with Nicodemus in John 3. How does he go about that conversation? What does that look like? How does he interact with a centurion, a soldier, in Matthew 8? How does he go about those relationships? How does he go about those interactions? Some people are not willing to admit their need for a savior and those who are and are ready and open to hear something from the lips of Jesus. Someone that has helped me in many times is David. If you don't know who David is, King David, right? You might know the story David and Goliath. David is a strong warrior. He leads men in battle. Men are drawn to him. They want to follow him because he's such a great leader. Women are attracted to him because he's handsome and faithful and does right things. He has plenty of screw-ups. But he also has close relationships, like David and his relationship with Jonathan. Okay, and you can read that, 1 Samuel 18 to 20. Lots of interactions between Jonathan and David. And also, in 2 Samuel, David's best friend Jonathan has passed away. How does he grieve him? He even goes as far to say, Jonathan, your love was better than the love of women because of Jonathan's steadfast loyalty to David, even when it cost Jonathan issues with the other kings. Two examples, okay? Second way. Your words, how you use your words. One more passage in Colossians, back over to the New Testament. Colossians chapter four. Colossians chapter four, verses five and six. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunities you have. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer everyone. As an employer, let's say you're the boss in your company, or you have some people working underneath you, your supervisor. Is the only time you talk to certain men is when there are problems around? Or do you go out of your way to give genuine compliments in a situation that matters? Do you find ways to praise what is right and good in the coworkers or the workers that are underneath you? Let's say you're on a certain level and you're talking with peers at work. Don't condescend while you're trying to ask a question, right? Some people say, you don't know what the heck you're doing. And it sounds like a question, but it's really just condescension. Or maybe you say, you didn't shut the door, did you? As if you already knew the answer to the question, just ask the question. Hey, did you shut the door? Did you take care of that? Great, okay, let's move on to the next thing. You don't need to like go out of your way to have like a, how many of you guys know the expression a backhanded compliment? 
just give a compliment. <laughs> you know, like you don't have to have it like, oh well, I would give him credit for this great idea, but you know, I can't do that. Okay. Number three, some values. If you have influence in your workplace, if you have influence in your family, extended family, neighborhood, right? What are some kinds of things you want in your environment? What kinds of values do you want to ascribe by? What kind of values do you want driving things? What's the opposite of a poisonous work environment? What's the opposite of toxic relationships with the people that you spend many hours a week interacting with? Something uh, I heard from my own father growing up, I don't go to work to make friends. He was a boss. He was a supervisor. I get it. Like, there is a differentiation between, okay, he's got some authority over these guys. But to say that as a blanket statement, that this does not happen, I'm not interested in making friends at work. I, you don't have to be best friends. You're probably not going to be best friends with everyone at work. There's plenty of people at work that you might disagree with. Totally get it. Okay? But I think that's a little bit of a wrong-headed statement. You can be friendly. You might even be a person who brings the light there to show like, hey guys, this is how I can go about being a supervisor, being a peer. That draws other men and say, you know, this is different. This is better. I like this. this. I actually want to be around this person. Number four, activities. I really enjoy having a time to work with other guys doing a project. Okay? That I would call doing stuff shoulder to shoulder. You're next to each other doing th something. That's great. Mem many memories being built. I also try to balance shoulder to shoulder stuff with face to face. Take some time to have, make sure you have face to face as well. Do stuff, but also, hey, we actually have a conversation. Not, we have coffee, we go out to breakfast, whatever. Right? Lots of opportunities to balance both. Lastly, but certainly not least. What does the gospel have to say about how we interact with each other? Back in Genesis 1 and 2, God gives humankind a glorious, awesome purpose. You are to rule over this world that I have made and make my glory known in all of my creation. Wow. Wow. I entrust this whole place to you. Now, Genesis 3 happens, and mankind says, you know what, uh, God, you're not good. Your word's not true. Sinning against you and turning our back and committing treason is not a big deal. We will reject you and go find it another way. Pride, right, competition, I think those are fruits and I think the deeper issue, perhaps, is who am I? Do I matter? If I'm not sure if I matter, or I got to find a way for myself to show how great I am by achievements, trophies, whatnot, uh, sexual expeditions, business ventures, all this kind of stuff. These, this is how men show they're great, right? This is the ideal of man. Um, I'm sorry. That's not what God says a man is, or it's not what God says how a man matters. You do matter. Men want it. You're made for something significant. God has made that. Chasing it through other means, outside of God's purview, is not going to lead to where you want to go. Finding your identity and whether you matter in him because he has drawn you up into the great story he is telling, the story of redemption, the story of transforming this world, and the story of you get to be with me in eternity to get back what was lost ruling over this earth. That is a story that matters because God is the author of that story. So, a couple of last questions. What does the gospel say about significance? Because if I can understand who I am, what I'm for, when people assail me with random jabs and blah, 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 no, it's okay. 
I'm, com- I'm, I'm comfortable. God is working on me. If I hear something that is a sin, yeah, I need to address that. But if I just hear random jazz because people want to do that, whatever. Talk off, water off a duck's back. But if I can find myself, ground myself, how can I ground myself in God's redemption? Have that be a firm foundation to draw other men in so that they might hear how good God is to do something, to say, those other stories you chase after are not worth it. Chase after me, chase after my kingdom, my righteousness, all these other things will be taken care of for you. Pursue it according to God's eyes and others will be drawn. Over the past 30 years of getting to know men at various circumstances, it's been like, you know, there's certain people I want to be around. And very often it's because they had this identity, they had this understanding of who I am in Christ. So let's pray, and we're going to head down to small group time. God, thank you that you have not left us back in Genesis 3 with a problem. You've given us a redemption story that matters. You've given us your very own son, that we can find who we are in him, that we matter because of what he has done, and we get to be a part of your great story. I pray that you'd help us to understand that, to be motivated by it, to also review how the ways we go after this, uh, what the world says is right and good, to review and say, is that what we should be doing? How do I change that? How do I renew my relationships with other men? How do I stand fast in the workplace? How do I stand fast in, with family relationships? How do I stand fast in my neighborhood? Lord, we love you. We trust you. We pray that you'd lead us and guide us as we go throughout the rest of this night. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.